Hello, welcome to our Eagle's Nest online service as we continue our sermon series studying the book of Ephesians. For this message, Pastor Jay highlights Ephesians chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Today's message reminds me of my own teaching experience. Before becoming the children's director at our church, I taught in an elementary school with around 900 students in attendance. As you can imagine, teachers needed to offer guidance for students to best understand how to safely and respectfully manage moving through the hallways. As the teacher would give guidance on how to walk, Paul is reminding us to walk as Jesus, the embodiment of God's word. But before today's message gets underway, let's prepare our hearts in worship. Powerful name. 
We're going to dig into chapter 5 of Ephesians today in a series with a letter to the saints in Ephesus. And last Sunday, we looked at a Star Wars storyline to discover the direction or the way in which we should go. Like followers of Jesus, we remember that this is the way. And this week will be equally important for us to learn how to walk in our faith, how to walk in the way. Today's sermon is borrowed from the great theologian Stephen Tyler and the mega band Aerosmith with a message titled, Walk This Way. I realize when you listen to that song's lyric, the title's about the only thing you can use in church. I heard that uh, Aerosmith, Aerosmith actually officially retired this year. They were formed from two bands that merged in 1970, so I guess 54 years was a long enough ride. I think most of us have probably learned how to successfully walk by now, haven't you? We might have some trouble getting around, some aches and pains from age or from injury, but by and large, we know how to do it, right? We know how to walk pretty good by now. So the question today becomes, are you learning to walk correctly? Are you getting trained from the only source that matters? Anyone can learn to mimic or copy somebody else's moves. Remember Millie Vanilli in the late 80s? <laughs> Those two guys lip synced to other guys' voices until they got caught. Blame it on the rain, I guess. If you don't get that joke, Google it. It's not enough to look good on the outside. And good appearances are not what we're after when it comes to learning how to walk out our faith. So what does scripture really mean when it tells us to walk this way? There's a movie called The Thin Man from the 1930s. And in 1936, this, you, some of you are like, I didn't even know there were movies in the 1930s. And the sequel came out called After The Thin Man. That's very clever, The Thin Man, then After The Thin Man. And these movies were classified as American murder mystery comedies. You got that? <laughs> American murder mystery comedies. And when it comes to learning how to walk this way, well, I think this movie scene is self-explanatory. Hey. Walk this way, sir. Well, I'll try. <laughs> Pull yourself together. Yeah, walk this way, sir. But that's not how, that's not the kind of walk we're talking about this morning. There was an article in Medical News Today, and they said that on average, little humans learn how to walk between 12 and 18 months, some as early as seven months. But they also said that each child develops the muscle coordination to walk in their own way. When it comes to learning how to walk, they shared five the five most common techniques toddlers will try before learning how to walk. So creeping, this is, this is basically the army crawl, where little ones used to learn their arms and kind of drag themselves around the room. I love that move. Then there's crawling. You know that one, using your hands and knees around to get around or to pick up your fork under the table. There's stepping. I bet everybody here has tried stepping, helping a little one learn to take steps by supporting them as they walk. And then there's pulling up, where kids use objects or even people to help them stand and learn balance. And then there's cruising, which is just basically pulling up with objects all around the room. And then one day, there's this joyful moment, right? When the child takes their first steps and they begin to walk. It's like a miracle. New parents, be careful what you wish for. They're much harder to keep up with, and the process begins. Well, these are just examples of the literal process of learning how to walk. But today in Scripture, as we've done many times before, we're going to learn how to walk a bit differently. Can we do that together? Remember the writer of Ephesians, the Apostle Paul, has just declared to us and to the saints of Ephesus, this is the way. Now we must learn how to walk in the way. And so here in chapter 5, Paul tells the church, walk this way. 
We're going to get into our main text. Ephesians 5 has more powerful instruction. Remember, we call them precepts for how to walk out our faith. And verse 1 begins by instructing us. Paul says, therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children. Remember the movie clip, Walk This Way, Sir. If we're going to mimic somebody, Paul says, be imitators of God. Imitate Jesus. Verse 2, and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us. Become a fragrant offering and a sacrifice to God. Verse 3, but sexual immorality and all impurity, covetedness, must not even be named among you as is proper among saints. That let there be no filth, filthiness, nor foolish talk, nor crude joking which are out of place. But instead, let there be thanksgiving. Verse 5, for you may be sure of this. Everyone who is sexually immoral or impure or is covetous, that is an idolater. By the way, an idolater is someone who worships an idol. This isn't just a little statue or figurine on your mantle that you bow down and pray to. That's way too obvious. An idol can be anything. Anything you hold more important in your relationship with God. Your job could be your money, your stuff, even other relationships. Paul says those idols... Those bad behaviors he just listed have no place. They have no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. And then verse 6 hits us with, Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Pause the DVR with me, if you would. We're going to pause right here on verse 6 for a moment, just because I don't want you to misunderstand what verse 6 is saying to us. Whenever we read things like the wrath of God and sons of disobedience, we want to crawl. We want to get on our hands and knees. And we can sometimes misunderstand God and even miss the heart of our Father in heaven and how he interacts with us, his creation. Other religions, denominations, and even incorrect teachings in the church can kind of throw us off balance, if you will, in areas like these. So let me try to clear up verse 6. If you're saved... If you're a true believer of Jesus Christ, you're a bit like a toddler, no offense, learning how to walk. Did you know that? And you need to know, as a Christian, you're still going to fall down occasionally. You're never going to achieve perfection this side of heaven. Your temporary shortcomings are not the kind of disobedience verse 6 is talking about. When we fail to live up to God's standards, you're not a failure. Don't fear that the wrath of God is coming down because of a weak moment. Believers are redeemed and restored regularly in their walk with God. Remember, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That's Romans 8.1. How is that possible? It's not because of you or me or anything we've done, but because of Christ's perfection. He covers us. He's, his righteousness gets imputed or imparted to you as believers. So forgiveness for the believer brings a washing and a, a clearing of conscience. It restores our ability to stay intimately close with our creator. It's like the psalmist cried out in Psalms 51.10, Lord, create in me a clean heart and renew a right spirit within me. So when we look at verse 6 in the original language, we find a more precise meaning of what Paul intended. The Greek word for disobedience here is apithia. Apithia. And it literally means an uncompliant disposition. Think of somebody who's willfully and intentionally stubborn. You don't know anybody like that, do you? <laughs> Watch out for the elbow, guys. A truly obstinate person. They intend to be disobedient. And unbelief characterizes their life. It's like a professed atheist refusing to accept that there's a God. He rejects Jesus and his free gift of grace. Going back to our toddler illustration, I think every parent could attest. You know when a child is trying their best to walk and they, they simply fall down in the process? Versus that kid in the grocery store falling on the ground intentionally, 
throwing a temper tantrum when they don't get their way, right? So we can confidently determine. This verse refers to those who don't know God and they don't want to know him. These are the sons of disobedience. He will eventually judge everybody with me. All right, let's keep reading as we learn together how to walk this way. We're in verse 7. Paul instructs us, therefore, do not become partners with them, those who don't believe. For at one time you were darkness. Church, you and I were also lost at one time, weren't we? Confused, blinded, and rebellious towards God before we met Jesus. But now you are light in the Lord. So walk as children of light. We're going to talk about that in a few moments, but for now, let's just keep reading this text. Verse 9 says, For the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. This is poetic language, instructing us how to walk. And we're to walk in goodness. We celebrated a few do-good moments earlier because the church should be known by their good deeds. In righteousness, this is not a holier-than-thou or judgmental posture, but an authentic attempt to walk correctly as Master Jesus, Rabbi Jesus, taught us to do. And third, true. What is truth? The truth can only be known by reading and obeying God's word. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Verse 10. So try to discern Christians. Church, that means to understand and then do what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of the things they do in secret, but when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible, doesn't it? For anything that becomes visible is light. We can try to get away with some stuff in the darkness, can't we? Until the spotlight is shined on us. You know, I think the number one way, the enemy of our souls, Satan, the great deceiver, the way he defeats Christians often is by telling you you're no good. Ha! You fell again? Get ready for the wrath of God. God doesn't love you. You can't even walk in a straight line without falling over. And the continual lure or trap of sin is to keep you falling for the same bait. He uses the same tricks over and over again. It's why we recommend small groups. Life groups, good accountability partners, people that you can trust that will walk with you, helping you to walk this way. You see, when you shine light on issues you're struggling with, that accountability defeats the devil's schemes. He doesn't like it. It takes his power away from you. And ultimately, it gives you back the power through the power of Jesus to defeat sin. Therefore, it says, awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. That's an excerpt taken from the prophet Isaiah in chapter 60, and he's declaring the, when the light of Christ shines, it isn't just darkness that has to flee. Even the dead will be raised to life. That's pretty powerful stuff. Let's finish reading our text before we break it down together. Verse 15 to verse 21 is next. Look carefully then how you walk. Yes, not as unwise, but as wise. Making the best use of the time because the days are evil. Do you believe that? They look pretty bad some days out there. Therefore, don't be foolish but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not get drunk with wine, that's debauchery, but be filled instead with the Spirit of God. Verse 19, addressing one another like you did this morning. 
in psalms and in hymns, spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything, the good, the bad, and the ugly, to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence to Christ. You know, there's so much to talk about in this very rich text of Ephesians 5. We're going to pull out the highlights in just a moment, but I thought it might be helpful to give you something to take home with you. Four points to remember for how to walk this way. We're going to use the acronym WALK, W-A-L-K. And the W in WALK stands for wisdom. If you go back with me to Ephesians 5.15, Paul says, look carefully how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of your time because the days are evil, therefore do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Notice church, we're to walk not as unwise, but as wise. Paul says if we're walking in wisdom, we'll understand the will of God for our lives and we'll do it. We get even more guidance on how to walk this out from the book of James. James, the brother of Jesus, becomes the eventual leader of the Jewish church in Jerusalem. James encourages the Gentile believers, along with the apostle Paul, to balance these concepts between faith and good works. And James tells us how to walk in wisdom, as Paul admonishes us to do in Ephesians 5.15, but you're going to notice it's not from a human perspective. I think you'd agree with me. There are plenty of people on this planet walking around who are wise in their own eyes. Are there not? True wisdom, remember, is learning to see things from God's perspective. That's true wisdom, and to seek and to know what the will of God is. James spells this out very nicely in James chapter 3, beginning in verse 17. It's an incredible text to take in as an apprentice of Jesus. James writes, the wisdom from above, wisdom from God, is first of all pure. It's also peace-loving, and it's gentle, but only when you feel like it. Only when things are going great. No, you have to be gentle all the time. Willing to yield to others. I love that one. That's fun. This isn't just letting cars go ahead of you in the Walmart parking lot or being polite while you're driving. This is yielding to the will of other people. When appropriate, it's putting other people first. Letting go of your preferences to accommodate theirs. Learning to swallow more words than allowing them to fly from your mouth. James says, when you walk this way, we are to be full of mercy. For mercy extends grace when you deserved punishment. Because you've been given mercy, Christian. Jesus says we must become quick to then extend mercy to other people. James says we will show them the fruit of good deeds. Look, we know that good deeds and good works can't save us. You can't be good enough on your own. James teaches us that. You can't do anything to make God love you any more than he already does. You can't earn his love because you already have it. But at the same time, for hearts that have been changed transformed by the love of Christ. Others are going to see that change by your good deeds. And finally, James says, shows no favoritism, and it's always sincere. Look, we don't always get to choose, pick and choose who we walk this journey with. There are times God brings people across your path. 
and he's expecting you to love them. Maybe you wouldn't have chose that person. Maybe you don't get anything out of the deal. Maybe it's not about you. We're called to love everyone equally without favoritism. And then sincerity, well, that's just the core value of Eagle's Nest, isn't it? We don't live up to it all the time, but we strive to. To become an ABC church, that's an authentic, that means sincere, biblical community. That's a non-fake, non-hypocritical, true follower of Jesus Christ. That's what we're trying to do here with you. It's like a toddler, if you will, learning how to walk. James teaches us to walk this way. If you were keeping track, that was eight traits, eight fruit for someone who is walking in godly wisdom. Be pure, peace-loving, gentle, yielding to one another, show mercy, have good deeds with no favoritism, and do it all in sincerity. The W, see that? Also stands for three in some cases. The W, number three, is for wisdom. And the A, since we're doing it, let's just go all the way. The A is for addressing. How we address or interact with one another. I don't like this one very much. Can we just skip it, please? Next slide. <laughs> if we go back to Ephesians 5, look at verse 19. Paul tells believers we should be addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart. Great. Does that mean I got to come up to you skipping and singing Jesus songs all the time? I hope not. That'll be annoying. Does this mean I got to sing my greeting every time we get together to address someone? You better hope not. It speaks to living out, listen to me, church, the lyrics we sing every Sunday in worship. It's poetic. It's the heart. It's the posture and our attitude by which we address one another. giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. We just said this walk is about our posture, our demeanor, and the attitude that is flowing out of a believer's heart. It's the fruit of a life that's been changed by Jesus and the inner workings of the Holy Spirit who makes the changes inside you. Addressing speaks to our interactions with other people. And this one stings a bit. Ready for it? The truth is, I don't always like you very much. <laughs> Sorry. I don't always like other people. I know that's not very nice. You're a pastor, but come on. I can't be the only one. Other people can be annoying. Other people can get on your nerves. Sometimes I just need my own space. Get out of my way. Leave me alone. Y'all, I'm just trying to be real. Don't look at me so holy. What's wrong with you? That's how I feel sometimes when I get in my flesh. Stop coming to the Delaware beaches. I don't want to sit in traffic anymore. Go home. But you know what? That's not God's perspective, is it? That's not how Rabbi Jesus wants me to interact with his people. It's not the way we should walk out our faith, is it? But just like you, I got to learn to set that selfish guy aside, to muzzle him and learn to address other people with the love of Christ. And other people can make it difficult to do. 
I used to say, I don't have to like you to love you, but I don't think that's very nice either. (laughs) And while I'm being honest, maybe just jump off the stage now. My wife will sometimes get a dig in. It happens to me a lot of the times when I'm driving. She'll lean over, and when I'm acting like crazy, she'll be like, okay, Pastor Jay. (laughs) And that gets me mad. (laughs) Then I start jerking the wheel like I'm at Funland in a runaway bumper car. (laughs) Okay, Pastor Jay. (laughs) So annoying. (laughs) Stay with me. While I'm in that moment, I may continue to respond in my flesh until I calm down, because yes, your pastor is carnal like that. But listen to me. I hear her. I hear what she's saying. I know what she means. When I finally come to my senses and I listen, I realize she's saying the exact same thing the Holy Spirit's been saying as he's been whispering gently in my ear, hey, Pastor Jay, be nice. That's not how I want you to talk. That's not how I taught you to walk. That's not how I expect you to address my creation. Dressing's a tough one, y'all. And I don't get a free pass either. But remember, you now stand for something much greater than the individual. We're called to be different. We're called to walk this way. We have to learn this together. Be more thoughtful how we address each other and use wisdom from above to slow down a bit wherever we go. Fair enough? If the W is for wisdom, the A is for addressing, then the L is for losers. Oh, (laughs) sorry. Oh, sorry. That wasn't very nice. See, I'm still learning. (laughs) No, the L is for love. It's for love. Verse 1 said, therefore be imitators of God as his beloved children. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us. If you've been around church, you've probably heard we should love like Jesus did. But guess what? Until we actually learn to do it, We're going to keep getting reminders. Be honest. We don't naturally like to walk this way, do we? The person we usually love the most is ourselves. It's not other people. And if you desire to become like Jesus, listen carefully to the words of the master in season four of The Chosen, which I still highly recommend to you. We find Jesus sitting on the steps of the Jewish temple. Remember, sitting down is a clue to the crowd that the rabbi has something to say. And it's from the temple steps, Jesus says these words that are recorded in John 10. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd sacrifices his own life for the sheep, but a hired hand will run When he sees a wolf coming, wouldn't you? They ain't your sheep. He will abandon the sheep because they don't belong to him. And he isn't their shepherd. And so the wolf attacks them and scatters the flock. The hired hand will run away because he's only working for money and he doesn't care about the sheep. And Jesus says again, but I'm the good shepherd. I know you. I know my own sheep, and they know me, just as my Father knows me, and I know the Father. So I'll sacrifice my life for you. Jesus continues teaching. If you'll skip down to verse 17, he says, The Father loves me because I sacrifice my life so I may take it back again. No one can take my life from me. I sacrifice it voluntarily. Please don't misunderstand what happened at the cross on Easter. Evil men didn't trick 
capture and murder our Lord against his will. Jesus laid down his life willingly for you. That was always the plan. A spotless lamb to be sacrificed to save us. Jesus says, for I have the authority to lay my life down when I want to and also to take it back up again. For this is what my Father has commanded. You see, Jesus' life on earth is the ultimate example to follow. Jesus walked this way. Even in his excruciating death on a Roman cross, It was all done in submission, in humble obedience to his Father's will. His sheep must also learn to do the same. you got to walk this way. Listen to the voice of the good shepherd. Obey his commands and follow him. Last week we said, learn to be with Jesus, your rabbi. Then learn to become more like him. Then go do as Jesus did. Finally, using a little imagination, if you don't mind, the K is for kids of light. Take a look at this video about the light before we continue. Yeah, so that's what it's going to be about. This final letter in the WALK acronym, K, is for kids of light. And you saw lots of practical applications of how to shine your light, even in the most simplest ways. If we go back to Ephesians chapter 5, verse 8, we will be reminded, for at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children, kids of light. Before you met Jesus, we walked around in darkness. Now you must walk as kids or children of light. How do we walk this way? By carrying the bright light of Jesus Christ everywhere you go. And while we do this, we're also, verse 10 says, discerning what is pleasing to the Lord. Ephesians says we're going to bear good fruit to those around us, to everyone living in darkness. What kind of fruit? Well, we talked about it earlier in verse 9. 
what is good, what is right, and what is true. You have to learn along with me to walk in goodness, in righteousness, and in truth. And it's not what you think truth is. It's not what you think it is. It's not what the politicians or the media outlets tell us truth is either. It's not what culture or society sways us to believe. It's not what's on social media, Twitter or X or any of those other ones. It's not what's in the most latest polls. It's not even what you might imagine or think or believe that it is. The truth only comes from one source. The source is the light of Jesus found in God's word. Let me share a short story with you to illustrate this point. It's from an unknown author, but I think it really illustrates the power of walking in the light. There once was a dark cave. Deep down in the ground, underneath the earth, hidden away from view. Because it was so deep in the earth, the light had never been there. In fact, the cave had never seen light. The word light meant nothing to the cave. The cave couldn't even imagine what light might be. And one day, the sun sent an invitation to the cave, inviting the cave to come up and visit. So when the cave came up to visit the sun, the cave was amazed. The cave was delighted. The cave had never seen the light before. He was dazzled by the wonder of the experience. The light was brilliant, illuminating everything around it, and its rays were bright and warm. Feeling grateful to the sun for inviting him, the cave wanted to return the kindness. So the cave invited the sun to come down to visit the darkness. Because the sun had never seen darkness. In fact, the sun didn't even know what darkness was. So the day came and the sun entered deep down into the darkness of the cave. And as he descended, the sun looked around with great interest, wondering and imagining what darkness was going to be like. The further down he went, the sun became more and more puzzled until eventually the sun asked the cave, I'm sorry, where's the darkness? You see, everywhere the sun went, its powerful light went with it. And here's the truth in that illustration. Darkness can exist without the light. It does it all the time. In fact, just like the cave, you might imagine when you look around this world, all that's left is darkness. It's pretty bleak out there most days, isn't it? All hope is lost. No, it isn't. Not until darkness meets the light. Try it sometime. Go into a completely dark room and flip on the light switch. Now try to find the darkness. You can't, can you? Darkness disappears in the light. And in that illustration, the light from the sun fills up the dark cave no matter how deep in the darkness he goes. And when you and I listen to the words of Jesus, we will learn to walk this way. You'll shine the light of Christ to the dark world around you. This is a light that doesn't need a battery. You don't have to plug it in. It doesn't need a recharge. Because this source of the light is the sun, S-O-N. And friend, he can light up any darkness. So as we begin to wind this down, here's the beautiful picture the Apostle Paul is painting in Ephesians chapter 5. He says, when you and I are faithful 
to carry the light of Jesus to a dark world. It's like someone hiding in a dark cave. They have no choice but to see that light coming. They don't have to like it, the light. It might hurt their eyes to, to look at it. They might even run back to the dark corners from which they came. But your job, church, and my job is to illuminate Jesus to everyone around us so that they can see the light inside us. What they do with it is up to them. If we could pursue Jesus like that, letting his light penetrate our hearts, maybe we could learn to walk this way. Thanks for listening. Can I pray for you and for me as we dismiss? Father, we are so grateful that we have your word, your presence that goes with us along this journey. God, I confess, I, I, I can be a jerk. I, I, I don't always love your people like you've called me to do. Would you help me with that? Lord, I pray for everyone in the room that, that we would begin to see things differently, not because we're smarter or wiser, but because we now have the perspective of God. It's what Rabbi Jesus teaches us in his word. God, help us to walk in wisdom. Help us how we address one another. Help us to speak and live with acts of love and become true kids, children of light. I pray for the one who feels like they're in a dark place, that the light of Christ, the gospel message from the Son, will reach down and grab hearts today. We thank you for your spirit. We thank you for your presence. Lord, help us. We can't do it on our own. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.